Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Young Funds. We're here at the Hepsibah Children's Home, and let's go now to an interview with Speaker Gingrich with Gene and Liz. Well, thank you for being with us today, Mr. Speaker. Um, first, I'd like to ask you, in New Hampshire, you talked about um, people being able to set up personal retirement accounts. You announced that and then spoke again in South Carolina. I haven't heard a whole lot about that um, on the national news. Is that still a very important it's point very in your It's very important. Platform? We're actually encouraging students on college campuses to organize in favor of it and have local clubs in favor of it. I think we have a hundred and some campuses where people have organized. And I really believe it's a very important idea. Uh, it helps save Social Security the right way, which is by moving to a savings and, and investment model rather than having politicians in charge of your life. It would be totally voluntary, and it would mean that you would take the part of the tax that you pay and it would go straight into a savings account. It would build up your entire lifetime, so when you did finally retire, you could build up probably two or three times as much money as you're going to get from the current system, and no politician would control it. So uh, that's what they do in Chile. It's worked perfectly in Chile. Uh, they now have so much savings that they have 72% of the economy in savings. Uh, and they actually allow Chileans now to invest outside the country because they have they brought in so much money that they can't deal with all of it. It sounds like you thought a lot about this, and it sounds like a, a pretty fascinating idea. But you've got to win the presidency to implement it. That's right. And part of my commitment to young people is that they need to help me win the presidency <laughs> uh, in order to be able to implement it. But I think, I think it's, it goes both ways. So Georgia is going to be very important for Super Tuesday for you. Uh, I assume that you think that is anyway. But we got to look forward. We got to look at Super Tuesday. And we got to look past Super Tuesday. How well are you going to do on Super Tuesday, and where do you go from there? Well, the number one concern has to be carrying your home state, as Governor Romney found out in Michigan. <laughs> and I think we're going to do better here than he did in Michigan. I think we'll have a much bigger margin than he had. But it's important. I'm here campaigning for four straight days because this is important. Uh, I also believe we'll do well in a couple other states, particularly Tennessee, Oklahoma. In Ohio, and then maybe uh, some opportunities in, in Iowa, I mean in Idaho, and in um, North Dakota, Alaska, and to a lesser extent Vermont and Massachusetts. I, I then think um, we will do very well the following week in Alabama and Mississippi. I think we'll carry both of them. And uh, we may carry Kansas, which has a, a caucus the following Saturday. So I think by uh, the middle of March, this will begin to look like a very different race. Excellent. And speaking of college students, um, got, I was fortunate enough to see you in South Carolina, yes. and I remember you speaking at Jimmy's Restaurant about how most college professors are abundantly liberal. Now, do you think this diminishes a college student's education, if that's the case? Yes, I think, I think it ends up being propaganda. I think, I think uh, there, there is a significant degree to which the things people are taught in college aren't true, and they have to go out and spend years on learning them. So how, do you, so how do you fix that as President of the United States? Well, you don't. I mean, as President of the United States, you point it out, and you hope that people will fix it themselves. And you hope that the Board of Regents will fix it, or you hope that the Board of Trustees in a private university, you hope the students will fix it. Uh, we live in a pretty open society, so you can, you can Google and Wikipedia a lot of stuff. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I think it's, if you look at the number of campuses, for example, where they don't even teach American history anymore, or if they do teach it, they teach only a weird version of it. Um, it's, it's really quite remarkable. So, do, so, so then should students do something alternative to college education? or college On occasion. Education? Look, I, I, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, right. uh, I think as long as you understand that a lot of what you're getting is propaganda and that it's, it's, the, uh, it's not about knowledge, it's about the values of the faculty, right. uh, then I think you sort of go in forewarned and, and you're armed against it and you can argue with it. I, I also think, though, there are cases where faculty grade people based on whether they pretend to be liberal. And I think that's totally wrong. I think students ought to file a complaint. If, that, if you end up being coerced by a faculty member intellectually, you ought to be prepared to file a complaint against them. Mm -hmm. And so lastly, uh, what are you doing to reach out to young people in your campaign? Well, I, look, we have a couple of things. First of all, $2.50 a gallon gasoline with our American Energy Plan, which most young people find desirable. Right. Second, we have a very aggressive jobs program. I helped Ronald Reagan with a 16 million jobs in the, in the 80s. I worked with Bill Clinton on 11 million new jobs while I was speaker. When I left office, we were at 4.2 percent unemployment. You're not going to pay off the student loans if you don't get work. Uh, so I'm trying to find a way to make sure that every young person can have a job. Third, I'm trying to offer you a social security plan that takes power away from politicians, gives it to you, and gives you two or three times as big a retirement income as you're going to get under the current system. And fourth, uh, the issue of, of, of Islamist radicalism and the issue of national security is, is your generation's issue. I mean, you're the ones who are going to be most at risk for getting killed. And so I think having a policy of strength and peace through strength 
is a very important part of a message to young people. Mr. Speaker, I just have one more question. You, you spoke about uh, being a bold Re uh, Reagan conservative. Um, one of the things Reagan was known for was being able to attract Democratic voters. In a general election, how are you going to do that as opposed to all of your current uh, opponents? Well, take, take for example, an, an Amer excuse me. <coughs> take for example an American energy program. Um, Seventy-nine percent of the country believes we ought to be independent of the Middle East. That's 79 percent of, lib of liberals, 79 percent of conservatives. It's a huge margin. And so if you campaign on issues that bring people to you, you know, I think you'll find a lot of Democrats who are making, who think 250 a gallon gas thing would be worth voting for. And so I think you find a lot of people who think paychecks would be worth voting for. So I'm going through a list of things. That you'll probably find even some Democrats among the students who think having their own personal Social Security account would be a lot better future than the current system. So I hope on issues, not on personality, not on gimmicks, but on issues to bring people together in a very big way. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much. Thank you all for watching the interview. We'll be right back to do some wrap-up analysis of the rally. Well, that was a very good interview from our um, own Gene and Liz. And, uh, but we wanted to touch on a few issues uh, that we saw in it and we wanted to talk about that we think that uh, young voters young voters would be interested in. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the questions Liz asked was about a personal retirement account uh, for young people to start now and then save up for it and then be able to retire as they get older. Um, Matt, what, did you, what, are, what are your thoughts on the personal retirement account that Newt Gingrich proposes? Well, my personal thought is, well, I think it might be a good idea. Um, I feel like most young voters don't know, um, don't know anything about retirement, don't know how to start saving for it, and it's not an issue that we look for um, in, a, in an election. So when it comes to young voters, I don't think that's an issue that he can really reach out and get us with because it is you know, 40 or 50 years away from some of us. So. And then a few questions I had about it that he's that he's never been able to answer uh, for me is that who's going to fund this? Where's the money coming from? Um, is it fully funded completely by college students as they're putting their, their money into a savings account? Is it a bureaucracy? And if so, if it's government run, it sounds like big government to me. So I don't know. Maybe if Newt can answer some of those questions. Um, one thing he mentions every time that I hear him talk about this is that it's modeled after the Chilean government. Right. Um, do you remember what Chile said about that a few months ago when he was in South Carolina, the uh, country? I don't, actually. Uh, so, well, so, I'll tell you. Right. <laughs> uh, the Chilean government released a statement and said, that's not how our system works at all. <laughs> and uh, so, I don't know, maybe, maybe parts of it work the same way, maybe some don't, but the Chilean government says it doesn't. Newt Gingrich is continuing to say that it's the same system. Right. Um, and that it works. I feel like that might be a little bit of research that Newt has to do yeah. uh, in order to do and that. They, which, yeah. you know, maybe he can get some of his conservative uh, professors uh, to do that, do that research for him. Okay. How did you, how did you feel about um, how he felt about what he said about uh, liberal professors and how that diminishes the experience for um, college well, students well, and diminishes all, America? The, the word he used was propaganda. Yeah. Um, I don't ever feel like I've been propagandized. Right. But I don't, I also don't think Mercer is a liberal bastion um, in, in a sea of education. Right. Uh, I, what I think a liberal education is, especially a liberal arts education from Mercer, um, it tells me that you get to think for yourself. You, um, the, the, my professors right. teach me to learn about all the issues, uh, about whatever I'm studying, whether it's politics or not. And be able to think, think, think critically, but with an open mind as well. Yeah. Right. So what did what did you? Think? Yeah. I, I don't know. I just don't. I don't like how he stereotyped a group of people and just assumed that because they are professors and professors do have a lot of power, but I don't think that professors as a whole, you know, try to influence their students. I think right. they try to teach their students, and I think that that is what Newt is failing to see in this situation. <laughs> Another point that um, we brought up and that he answered was that he compares himself to Ronald Reagan. Often. Right. And Gene asked him, um, Ronald Reagan was able to reach out to Democrats and get Democrats on board with him to vote for him um, and sort of compromise right. compromises in Washington. He repeatedly says that um, he's, a, he's a Reagan conservative 
will we be able to do this? Right. I, I don't think that he's a Reagan conservative. Re Reagan compromised on a lot of things and, you know, got things passed through. And I don't think that Newt is going to do that. I think he, like he said in the interview, he thinks that his solutions to issues are going to stay on their own and people are going to read or, like, realize the validity of those solutions. And that's just not, that's not the case. He says that 79% of Americans believe that we should be independent from uh, the Middle East on energy resources. And to me, that says that if 79% of Americans say that, the Democrats are also coming up with a strategy on how right. to do that. So I don't, I don't completely buy that he's going to be able to get 79% of Democrats on board with him mm -hmm. um, to go to, to back his energy policies. Because Barack Obama um, has a, an all above solution to energy. Right. Yeah. You know? it, we have to wrap it up uh, to go. But I guess one last point is he's called grandiose Newt for a reason. And so I don't think that his plans are going to be valid um, on their own because people are always going to be skeptical of them. And so now, since uh, let's go and check out the rally. Okay. Good evening, everybody. If you'll please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Atkinson, who worked really hard and who made a lot of this possible tonight, is a great volunteer. And I want to recognize uh, former Congressman Mac Collins and his wife Julie, who are here with us too. They're right over there. And, uh, <laughs> it is great to be here at Epsilon, which is a facility for children and helps children. It goes back over 100 years. And it's uh, the kind of thing we need more of because it tries to help very troubled children and tries to do so in a very faith-based way, which is exactly the right approach because you have to deal with the spiritual side of people in order at times to help their other sides. And so I'm thrilled to be here. I think it's a great place to recognize and to appreciate. And I hope all of you will appreciate the work they do for children. I. Uh, President Obama gave his second energy speech in the last week today in New Hampshire. And his uh, secretary of anti-energy, <laughs> Dr. Chu, testified yesterday in front of the House and then gave himself an A-minus grade this morning. Now, I did Neil Cavuto this afternoon on Fox, and Neil asked me about Dr. Chu's A minus grade. And I told him I thought actually, based on Dr. Chu's values, he did deserve an A minus. He has said publicly that he wants Americans to pay European level gasoline prices, which would be nine or ten dollars. And he's doing an outstanding job of moving us towards those gas lines. He has said clearly he is against oil. Uh, he is uh, considering electric cars. He thinks someday we could use natural gas. Uh, one, one of the keys to liberalism is they're always for whatever isn't currently available. And uh, I remember in Jimmy Carter's period, they were against the D1 bomber because they were for the B2, but the B2 didn't exist yet. But they wanted, didn't want to build the B1 because they wanted to spend the money on the B2 because if it ever did exist, it would be really cool. And therefore, why can't 
So the president last week went to Florida, and I noticed he dropped this today. Uh, maybe because it was a little embarrassing in the retrospect. He went to Florida, and he said, people who tell you we can drill our way out of this are either not telling you the truth or they're just misinformed. He said, drilling is not a solution. And he then said, algae is the solution. It, it reminded me in the moment in the movie The Graduate, where the guy says to the young graduate, plastic. And the kid says, what? He says, I'm telling you the future. Go into plastic. Mr. President, I think algae could someday be a significant asset. I'm, I'm committed to science. I'm committed to developing biofuels. I think someday we may well get the kind of breakthroughs in battery power that we need, the doctor choose so excited about it. I believe it's very possible, particularly with the new finds in natural gas, to develop a natural gas car. I first saw a natural gas car while I was speaker, when T. Boone Pickens brought it up and showed it to me. So this is not exactly new technology, but it requires a huge infrastructure. And I'm, I'm willing to explore that. I think there are lots of things we can do as a country in the future. And I'm willing to invest in them. But it is a fact that we know how to drill. It is a fact that we know how to build pipelines. We have a president who's against it if it's available, but he's for it if it's not available. He doesn't want the oil companies to invest money because they actually know what they're doing. So he wants Dr. Chu to invest money so he can throw away a half billion dollars at a time on companies like Solibra. So we can have bureaucrats pretending they're national capital. Now, I would say the point here, venture capital is a very tricky, complex thing. And the first thing you know about the people in the bureaucracy is they don't think like a venture capitalist. Because if they did, they would be making several million dollars a year on venture capital. So if you go to a nice, really smart, decent person who is sitting in the bureaucracy studying paperwork, you probably don't want to give them a half billion dollars to invest because they won't have a clue. And frankly, what the president doesn't get, and I, I can't tell the liberals how much of it is because they don't care, how much of it is because they live in a fantasy world, how much of it is because of their background. I mean, you know, the president, after all, was in Chicago, has an elevated, uh, he taught on a campus. I don't know how often he actually drove. He may not have very often made, but actually filled up a car. Um, I, I do know that when he went to campaign against Scott Brown in the special election in Massachusetts, uh, his speech that Sunday he made a big point about Scott Brown's truck. And the president goes off on this whole riff about big trucks. And I tried at the time to say that it's very hard to put a gun rack in a Prius. <laughs> More recently, I upgraded that line to it's very hard to put a gun rack in a bullet. <laughs> and by the way, we actually ended up with somebody in Atlanta who owns a Volt doing a YouTube video where they proved that you could put a gun rack in the trunk. <laughs> and so a friend of mine from Camilla who hunts looked at that video, and he turned to me and he said, well, where do you put the deer? <laughs> now, I want to be clear, I'm, I'm not against the vote. I think it's a little absurd that the president wants to give $10,000 per car away. Um, and this is actually a reverse distribution. The average family that buys a vote is $170,000 annually. So the idea we're going to give them $10,000 tax credit 
is a little strange for a president who loves taxing the rich unless the rich do what he wants. Okay. Um, I don't care if you buy it, please. I don't care if you buy it all. What I don't like is politicians and bureaucrats deciding they will tell us what we are allowed to do with our money. Yeah. Let me make very clear how big the difference is between Barack Obama and Newt Gingrich, all right? I want an American energy policy that makes us independent of the Middle East. I want an American energy policy so no president ever again bows to a Saudi king. We are in the middle of a technological revolution which the Washington elites are terrified of. Now we can produce natural gas from shale. We couldn't do it 15 years ago. If you went back to the year 2000, you would find that we expected to have seven years supply of natural gas, and we thought we were going to bring in liquid natural gas from the Middle East, and we're talking about building huge ports to receive this liquid natural gas. Now, because of new technology, we have 125 years supply, and we're talking about building a liquid natural gas facility to send it to China as an export to earn money in the United States. I'm for earning money. And here's what's happened. Because we have all this new technology, the price of, of natural gas has dropped from $8 a thousand cubic feet to about $3, and then some people think it's going to go down to $2. It's called supply and demand. We suddenly exploded the supply. So if you did have natural gas facilities for cars, and if we did build flex fuel vehicles, which I support, then you would have to go up to a station and choose. And you would find that you could probably buy dramatically less expensive natural gas right now. It'll be driven by market forces. Now, the ironic thing is, the president in his two energy speeches references what's happening to natural gas. And he says they may create 600,000 new jobs in this decade off of natural gas. And you have to say to yourself, Mr. President, you do understand the way we're getting this natural gas is called drilling. <laughs> So, so if drilling doesn't work, how come drilling is working? So the president would like to be for drilling if it's natural gas, but against drilling if it's oil, because drilling doesn't work with its oil, but it does work with its natural gas. Now, I mean, this is a level of confusion that even for a Harvard Law graduate is a little bit frightening. <laughs> now let me carry a step further. The second half of this revolution is North Dakota. And North, and North, are you excited by it or are you from it? I can't quite tell you about that. Now here's what's happening in North Dakota. And this again is, is the, I think, deliberate dishonesty of President Obama. He claims credit for increased production. The increased production is on private land where he couldn't stop it. On federal, on federal land, production's down 11% since he became president. So what happened on the private land that he couldn't stop? All of a sudden they discovered, this is an amazing number, there's at least 25 times, not 25%, 2,500 percent more oil in North Dakota than they thought. Here's what Washington can't cope with, and here's why every liberal in the country is terrified. If you take the natural gas story from seven years to 125 years, and by the way, that's with current technology at the present time, and you take the North Dakota story, 25 times as much natural as oils are talking about, it is the end of this whole theory of peak oil. For all practical purposes, there is no knowable peak 
within your lifetime because new technology brings online new capability. Your estimated geologic reserves are a trillion, 400 billion barrels in the United States, the largest supply on the planet. Now, in North Dakota, the side effect of the great energy plan is, guess what? Unemployment's down to 3.5%. And that overstates because there are 16,000 jobs they can't fill because the 3.5% doesn't have the right premium. So if these folks were retrained, they might be at zero. And when you have that much energy being produced, the state governors now have seven consecutive tax cuts. And they have a multi-billion dollar rainy day fund for a government that only spends $2 billion a year. Now, if you were conservative, you would look at this and you'd say, hmm, more jobs, more revenue for government without a tax increase, greater national security, which part of this don't I like? <laughs> but if you're a liberal, you would do what Obama's U.S. attorney did. He filed a lawsuit against the oil industry in North Dakota. Because they will do anything they can. They're also, by the way, trying to find ways to close down the natural gas fracking. They will do anything they can to slow down the development of new energy because if we get new energy, the cost will be too low for them to make their electric cars successful. And therefore, we are being bad people. Hey guys, welcome back. We're gonna do a wrap up of the rally now, and we're sitting with Sonia Harrison and Kevin. Help me with your last name. Harris. Kevin Harris. <laughs> I okay. know it's confusing. Yeah, they confuse me. Um, they are behind Newt Gingrich's campaign here in Georgia. And first, I want to direct my question to you, Sonia. The first one: um, Is Newt Gingrich going to win Georgia on Tuesday? We hope so. Uh, Newt is the best candidate out there, and we feel like we have a great ground game here. And hopeful that our, all our friends in Georgia, and especially the ones out of this rally, will come out and What have you done so far? Uh, what have, what's been your campaign strategy? Well, our campaign strategy has been a grassroots strategy. We've been very grassroots dominant. And I feel like we're a good game. Kevin has helped put our grassroots strategy together. And so we have uh, got a good team. Kevin, what, um, what do you do after Georgia, after, after Newt wins on Tuesday? How do you carry that momentum on to other states like Mississippi and Alabama? Well, with, with Mississippi and Alabama coming up next Tuesday, the following Tuesday, it's important to win Georgia and do well and reason the money. In South Carolina, generally, the three days after South Carolina, we raise a million dollars each day, the first three days after the next year. Um, and a good summer of Georgia victory. Winning in Georgia is going to give him momentum and money, as you said, but winning in other places on Super Tuesday is probably going to give him even more. Um, is he going to win Tennessee or Oklahoma? We've got a competitive ground game in several states, and we are only responsible for Georgia. Yeah. 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 Our, our primary focus yeah. is Georgia. Yeah. 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 But I will tell you, we will, you're watching basically the, the tail end of the new run is definitely the front runner. Um, you watch Michelle Bartman come along, you watch Herman Kane come along, you watch Rick Perry, and now it's Rick Santorum's turn. When uh, his numbers start going back down, we're going to turn back up and we'll start seeing us going to come back. It's been an amazing campaign cycle, as the speaker has said often. Sure it's, kind of like, uh, it's kind of like Space Mountain at Disney. <laughs> you're going in the dark, and sometimes you're up, and sometimes you're down, and you don't know where you're going. And sometimes you don't know where you've been. So it's been an incredible journey, and unlike any campaign season. Well, um, I think that's all the time we have, but thank you guys very much for being with us. We appreciate it. Go vote. Yeah, we will. Yes, ma'am, we will. Hey, folks, welcome back. We're now here again with Trent White, Matt Hickman, and Liz Bibb. Um, I got to tell you, folks, this has been an interesting uh, 
Pally, to say the to say the least. Met a lot of folks here. The interview was fascinating. I'm gonna wrap it up a little bit. I want to get our takes on rally, the primary, and then what's gonna happen after uh, Super Tuesday. So Liz, go ahead. Give your give your brief analysis of what you think is gonna happen in Georgia. Is, is it going to matter? And uh, what happens after Super Tuesday? Well, Georgia's a really delicate, rich state, and Georgia's a state that's very representative of the South. Um, it's a larger state in Super Tuesday than states like Tennessee as far as uh, representation of the South goes. And as we've seen in the past, uh, winning big in the South can actually give you a lot of momentum sure. to carry forward as far as the primary goes. We spoke, as you can see earlier in our interview, we spoke with Speaker Gingrich. He believes that he will do well in Georgia, and he seems very confident that that will give him and I would not be surprised. Judging by the crowd here, I would not be surprised if you won here. Trent? Yeah, the um, crowd, Liz, I wanted to bring up the crowd as well. Very different crowd here than was in South Carolina when we were there. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, um, He's so angry. He was in South Carolina. He was. He but wasn't here, angry today no, at all. No, he is relaxed. He's killed. Um, he's, I think he's showing up that he's up nine points in the polls in Georgia. I think he could even win by 12 or 13 honestly and a big win in Georgia is going to give him more money and more momentum and more uh, more stage presence on the national beat. But Matt, is he going to win anywhere besides Georgia? I mean, how is he going to get him before he wins one state? See, that's what, I, that's what I'm worried about is he's just going to win in Georgia and not win these other states. He, I, I think he's going to do well in Georgia. I think he's going to win. He's going to get those delegates. But he needs to focus on Tennessee and Oklahoma and other southern states that are kind of like Georgia but a little bit different and focus on them because he needs to either win those or come in a very close second in order to take that momentum forward because he can say, oh, we didn't win, but see how well we did compared to Rick Santorum. Or Drake Mohan, maybe whoever comes in third. Yeah, maybe he doesn't win Tennessee, but I think that he has a, a decent chance of winning there. Uh, but is this about Ohio? Isn't this about Ohio, though? Well, first, it's, yeah, Ohio's very important. It's a swing state. It but is. It's, but I don't think that he's, I don't think he's going to win Ohio. Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum are battling it out there. Um, it seems like Mitt Romney has an upper hand. What's, what's his strategy here? That's what I want to know. Is what's his strategy right now when you have a very, what's become a very clear two-man race that he was once one of the men in, and now he's here and he takes the fourth place loss in Michigan. What's his strategy when he falls? He, he wants to, he doesn't want to necessarily win all of the states that he can on Super Tuesday, but he wants to win, he has to win Georgia because it's his home state. And he wants to do very well in the elements. Maybe a second or a third or a high third place. He wants the percentage points. And uh, if he proves that he can pull well in in the Midwest and other areas around the country, then he's uh, that he believes that he's gonna be able to rise I think, again. I think he wants to couple what's gonna happen on Super Tuesday, what's gonna happen the week after in some more southern states and then what's coming up, what's coming up. Coming up it's going to be um, Alabama, Alabama right? and Mississippi and I southern think, states. I think maybe a few others, but they're right. southern states and I think he wants to get enough momentum from Super Tuesday to carry him into those two and they're probably gonna be large victories just like Georgia for him so that way he can push through on and regain a national presence when, it, when the primary season starts picking back up and you start having more debates and just having more national presence. Trent, when we were in South Carolina, the issue was uh, vastly different than what they they are not. Yeah, today he's talking about energy and foreign policy mostly. And he talked about foreign policy in South Carolina, but with a very different tone. And we've been saying that the South Carolinians were angry or that he was angry in South Carolina. And what I mean by that is he was up there encouraging the crowd to say things like, Obama's a Muslim and Obama's a terrorist. And I don't know that, maybe he wasn't encouraging them to say they're that. They're in that's there, a, that's I promise you. I talked to him before well, the rally, but, but they're not but as, listening. They were already coming. He's, but not, he's not whipping them up but like But when you listen was. to the crowd, he's saying things like, there are moderate Muslims that we can live beside peacefully, but there are radical Islamists out there. He's, it's very toned down, and it's not as, as emotional. As it, was, as it was in South Carolina. And he's focused on energy, which I think is really important, especially as gas prices are starting to rise. And Jordan's care a lot about uh, energy prices because we're a very agricultural society which requires a lot of gas to do all that stuff and a lot of gasoline. But is that, is it, and so we care a lot about gas and care a lot about energy and keeping costs down. And I think that's something that he's really getting up to. You know, I think it's a smart move for him to, to be more reserved and less emotional yeah. in this situation, in the situation that he's in with the primary. When he was a front runner in South Carolina, he was no 
coming up. It was basically, it was any man's race yeah. when he was in South Carolina. It was okay to be more emotionally feel right now. I think he needs to be more discreet and smart. You know, South Carolina politics are a bit dirty. Right? True. Sure. 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 I want to throw something out here because I talked to an insider. I won't make his name. He has to to in the new campaign. But this is an interesting aspect. We talked earlier this week about the possibility of the media giving Romney the big mo and that Romney has the big mo. But we haven't really talked other than of why other than he won Michigan. Santorum's done come out and said it's a 15-15 split. Talking to the new campaign, they have an interesting perspective. This thing's getting expensive, not just for everyone yes. involved, but for the media. The media has spent a lot of money to cover this stuff, and they're not making money off of it, so they obviously want it to end so they can get to the more money cash crop thing. Tell me, guys, is the media trying to force this thing to a win, or is this actually a good time? Oh, so that sounds... Oh, well, listen, I'll go ahead and talk to media girl. I mean, no, I don't think they're trying to force it to a win. Okay, I'll, I'll, yes, I do think they're trying to force it to a win, but I would disagree with whoever said that they're trying to do that because of money. I think uh, they're trying to do it because America wants a winner, which I guess it does connect back to money. Everything America ties back to money. America wants to know that there's a winner. America is going to get bored. Which no, Democrats better. are loving the, the now, blood fest. Yeah, right. We are loving <laughs> all of the them tearing each other apart and just This them makes them look weak, right? Yeah. I mean, Nick looks weak. Rick isn't looking as what he's talking about, and we haven't seen Billy really Newton in a month. There's no Dude, winner. Okay. I think so. To the point of the media trying to excuse me to um. It's a hot crowd out here tonight. To change <laughs> to to end the race right. sounds a little bit of. I, I don't know. I think that's just too broad. That sounds like I'm not people, people accuse the, that liberal media of doing that with Obama. The media anointed I'm, Obama. I, you know, I mean, exactly I don't remember the media. I, don't think, yeah. I mean, the media has a liberal bias, but they're not going to try and push a candidate out just thinking they get higher revenue. I think they're going to report the horse race, and that's what the horse race is doing. Because the media were picking down, a candidate, and they were liberal. Wouldn't they be picking somebody besides Romney? He has the best chance of beating Obama. <laughs> yeah. I will say this, though, and you guys talk to me about this, especially you guys, because you've been all over this place tonight. Liz's been running around doing other stuff. She's been over there in North Macon, you know, hanging out with the hot toddies, you know. But uh, unlike, for some reason, when I saw all of the crowds that were one of the other candidates, I saw a lot of young people pouring into it. A lot of them. I mean, even the upper folks, still 30s, not old. Is Newton doing a smart thing here by trying to get in the, you know, what I would say innovative people? Is he trying to not just get that crowd in for, you know, votes or young votes per se, but actually for fresh blood? We spoke with a campaigner um, behind the stage, and she told us they're not going after the older white males, right? They got it. They got it in Georgia. So they've really been reaching out and trying to target. Uh, a different voter base. Yeah. They, yeah. Want to, they, 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 yeah. they want to diversify the Republican Party. Georgia has a very diverse Republican Party, as I mean, as you know, and they want to target every individual section of that because that's how you get your numbers up, and that's that's how you get the 13 percent or the 12 percent lead instead of the 9 percent lead, and that's how you carry. That's how you that's how you get the momentum that he needs to carry into other cities. If you practice this, reaching out to those groups here in Georgia, where it's safer for him to win, he can do it better uh, elsewhere. Good trial ground to try and pick up some guys. All right, wrap it up, Liz. Tell me right now, after Super Tuesday, does new teamers get the momentum going forward, or is this all just spinning the wheels? No, no, I think he's spinning his wheels. We talked uh, in class about, you know, there was a split this, uh, feeling on who would take Oklahoma. That's one of those states that Gingrich said he was going to take tonight. I don't know that he can do that. Will he take Georgia? Probably. But I'm with Trent. Will he take Tennessee? Maybe, maybe not. Even if he does not with enough, I think it's going to be, I, I, I just think he's spinning his wheels at this point. I agree with Liz. Uh, interesting point on Oklahoma. Senator Tom Coburn, who served as a new, uh, called him a poor leader. That man's been, to be honest, elected and re-elected there. They really, he has a, one of the highest popularity ratings of any member of Congress. Um, no, I don't think he's going to win there. Yeah. Um, I hope he's going to win Georgia. That's pretty much a given unless something drastic happens. However, I think that his chances in the other two states we're talking about are relatively low. And I think once that happens, he's not going to have the momentum to carry through a week from Tuesday when he handles other smaller, or when he handles other southern states. 
And so I really think that if Super Tuesday doesn't go the way he thinks it's going to go, then we're going to see him in the I think it's all about Ohio, but I think it's all going to keep going on until the, I think there's going to be a contested convention. I don't think Romney's going to end up winning this thing. I don't, if that means that he wins. They may call me a bold, a bold guy, I guess, but uh, I don't think this means much. I think Ohio means everything, but I also think it's a win for Santorum, maybe a win for Newt. We'll have to see. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks to talk about how this all turned out. Thanks, guys.